not prayer requests. These are people who are in need of prayer. Again, like with our other list, the Lord knows what each and every one of us needs. But we lift everybody up because we feel like because the Lord asks us to reach out to Him and to let Him know what our needs are. Ben, if you will, oh, forgot about the stick. We have a decal. If you will send in your uh, name and a good address. Uh, we'll put your name in the book. Pastor Woody will send you a decal that says Rock and Country Church is praying for me. We pray over this book constantly. We pray over it on Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Saturdays, Fridays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, any day we get together, any day we don't get together. When we pray, most of the people in this book uh, pray over this book and pray over the people in it. Gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats. Dear Lord, we ask that you lay your hand upon each and every name that's in this book, Lord, that you will lift them up, that you fulfill whatever needs they may have, that you will cure the sick, that you will just come to them and just be in, let them be in your presence, Lord. We thank you so much for the ability to come to you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the blood that washes our sins away, Lord. We ask that you will lift up Pastor Woody as he delivers today's message, that you'll deliver, um, Lift up all the churches in the area, the ones who are preaching your words and the ones who aren't, that you will touch the preacher's heart and bring him to you to teach your word. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon our offerings and allow it to you be used for your needs and will, Lord. We thank you for the community we live in, and we just ask that you will lay your hands upon each and every one of them. Lord, we thank you for all you do, for all the blessings, for all the grace you lay upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, Rockin' Country Church. All right. All right. Well, I don't know when they're going to put it up there. There you go. All right. If you see this up here on the bulletin board, it's a good timing, Mike. All right. What are we going to do or what I'm going to try to do from this point on is uh, I may not give you the scriptures. It's actually 6 through 19. We're going to continue where we left off last week. But I want to go ahead and give you, while I'm doing a few little small announcements that I need to do, I want to go ahead and give you the scripture so you can turn into your Bible. That's our main scripture. Now, as you know, or those of you who have been here, coming here for a while, that ain't the only scripture we're going to look at, right? right. Yeah, that's right. We're going to look at a bunch of them, but that's our main scripture for today. So if you'll turn your Bibles, open your Bibles to John 17, Gospel of John, chapter 17. We're going to study today verses 6 through 19. All right, with that, I want to uh, do a couple of announcements while you're turning and the announcements are simply this. Uh, as you, Chris mentioned earlier, we have our boys, uh, boys uh, trail life. And now we're starting and getting ready to start up our girls, uh, American Heritage Girl, which is kind of like scouting, but it's a Christian-based organization. And we're chartering both those troops here at the church. Chris is our troop leader for the boys. Raise your hand back there. Everybody look back there and see Chris so you know who he is. And Miss Melissa uh, Clark is going to be our, I mean, <laughs> Melissa Clark. <laughs> Never mind, Clark. <laughs> That's her husband. <laughs> I, I always call him Melissa and Clark, so I just kind of, Melissa Long, if you'll raise your hand, Melissa, that's going to be our American Heritage Girl troop leader. So if you have any questions on any of that, those are the two people that you need to contact, all right? Sorry about that. Clark just wanted to be mentioned. He paid me 20 bucks, all right? <laughs> no, but anyway, I, I, we're looking forward to that. Our troop, our boys' troop has grown from one here recently to 16, 16 boys. I mean, it's, there, it gets going. It's growing good. Uh, I know you guys are going to be very, very disappointed, but Terry and I have a wedding of my nephew next uh, Saturday, so you won't hear me sing because we won't be able to be here for karaoke because the, the wedding's at four and it's in Arlington. I know, I know I'm sorry. We'll yeah, we'll pre-record a song. Oh, yeah, right. Actually, the reason that I bring that up is, is because uh, that is a good time for you to come if you think you, if you, think you can sing, all right? And uh, some of us sing anyway. Uh, but it's a good time to come and, uh, because we are looking for people who want to do a special song. We're looking for people who want to join our, our praise and worship team, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you think you're a singer, and I'm not, so, uh, but if you think you are or want to try or want to do a special. Uh, now, please understand, we love you. But, you know, if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you're probably not going to lead praise and worship, all right? 
So don't be don't be have, have your feelers hurt if if we say, eh, well, you know, just sing, keep singing in the shower. It'll be okay. All right. But uh, but if you think you can sing and you want to sing, then go ahead and, and come to our uh, karaoke because it'll be great and we'll have a lot of fun. All right. Uh, a couple other things I want to talk about real quick is our luncheon today. As you see, we have our tables and all set out. There's plenty of food. It doesn't matter whether you brought anything or not, especially you new friends who have who are visiting today or who have come today and will soon be members, maybe members of the congregation. I just know you will. Okay. But please stay. It doesn't matter if you brought anything or not. We have plenty of food. If we don't, McDonald's is down the street. Sonic's that way. We'll take care of you. We'll feed you, all right? But stay in fellowship with us because that's the most important part. Uh, some great news. Number one is, is I am uh, continually uh, blessed by knowing that our brother Ted and sister Beverly are still healthy today. We love them. We've missed them so much because of their, their health issues. But I, I was so blessed in my heart to see you guys here again today because I know it's a struggle with what you guys are going through and have been going through. But we know that God's a healer, right? And God takes care of his children. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Arlene, what was her last name? Arlene Cordova, which is Jenny's uh, one of Jenny's daughters, uh, she was found to be cancer-free this week. From uh, She lives out in California. Amen. And then also Jack Ray, who is uh, now home from uh, his, his heart attack, basically, uh, is now home and doing well and in good spirits, etc. So we give God praise and thanks for all that. Because we know he's the healer, not us, right? Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, the other thing that I want to lift up in prayer is the people in South Carolina and the people in Florida and, you know, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, all those areas that were hit by the hurricane. And I uh, want to lift them up and keep them in our prayers because Florida certainly was devastated, devastated. And for those of you who have been with me through the Cowboy Church period, um, Sue and uh, Crash Carell, who have been here before and are friends of mine, boy, it went right over their house. I, I don't know what kind of shape they're in, but anyway, it just they're building a new house, and hopefully it didn't tear it all up. But it, that, that path went right over where they, their new place that they live. So anyway, uh, all those people in Florida need to be lifted up. What is it, John Luke? I'll listen to you. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Well, we'll lift up that family as well, okay? All right. So thank you for that, John Luke. Okay, thank you, brother. That's Bentley, Bentley's neighbor. All right, so we'll lift them up as well. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, we'll pray for our children, and then we'll dismiss the kids. And it looks like there's a whole bunch here. Are you teens going to, if you teens are going to go back, uh, I guess we'll call the police and get them in here, make sure they get straight. No, no, just kidding, just kidding. But anyway, uh, let's pray up our children's ministry today and then uh, our teaching, and we'll get on with it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life itself. Father, I do thank you for all those uh, new folks, new friends that are here today. I ask, Lord, that you open up their hearts, minds, souls, and, and spirits, as well as ours, in order to receive your word, Lord, as you would have it. Let that word resonate in our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits so that we may carry the message of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Father, be with us today and, and guide and direct all things for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's go ahead and dismiss the kiddos. And we're going to be, of course, our scripture for today is going to be in John 17. So if you don't have a Bible, we'll be happy to give you one. We have some back in the back. Does anybody need a Bible? If you do, raise your hand. Everybody okay? Uh, for those of you who are vis I don't want to say you're visiting today. I'm going to say that you're, you're, just, you're here today to start your new adventure with us, okay? And we look forward to you being here each and every Sunday. But just to let you know, we teach the scriptures here. We don't, uh, I don't preach to you. You know how bad you are or have been, or whatever, but let me show you and tell you how great God is, 
And what he can do for me, he can do for you. And believe me, if he would save me, as Paul says, a wretch like me, if he would save me, he'll certainly save you, all right? He'll certainly, because he loves you. He died for you. He died for you. Whether you know it or not doesn't matter. The fact is, is that Christ died for all of those who would believe, all right? For all those who would believe. John 3, 16, we're not going to look at that today, but I'm going to reference it. John 3, 16, for whosoever shall believe it in him shall not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. I hope you're a whosoever. I was. Now I'm a child of the Most High God. <clears throat> and that's how I identify myself. Last week, uh, we were discussing John 17, 1 through 5, the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. This is the true Lord's Prayer. This is where Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus prays. Not only does he pray for himself, which tells us that we can pray for ourselves, because believe it or not, some people don't think that they can pray for themselves, but you can and God hears those prayers. Well, God's not going to hear my prayers because I'm this, I'm that, I've been this, I've been that, I lived here, I lived this way, I did this, I did that. Wrong, 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 wrong. You call out to Jesus and he will hear your prayers always. Always. There's never a time that God does not lend his ear to those who call on his name. I used this last week in the blind Bartimaeus laying on the side of the street, never seen Jesus because he'd been blind all his life. He heard Jesus was walking by and he hollered, Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus stopped dead in his tracks, turned around and says, what can I do for you? And he will do the exact same thing for you if you call on his name. See, that's the whole key, friend. You got to speak out. You got to tell Jesus you need him. You got to announce to Jesus, I need you. You don't need me. You don't need anybody else in this room. You don't need anybody else in this world. But you do need Jesus. You do need Jesus. And Jesus will stop in his tracks for all of those who call his name. That's how simple it is. You don't have to drop to your knees and pray. You don't have to be a great person because none of us are. None of us are even worthy, believe it or not. Only Christ makes us worthy. But all you have to do is from your heart call on his name and you will stop him in his tracks. And he will listen and lend an ear to you. And he will hear every word, every word that comes from your heart. Every word. We discussed how Jesus was in his glory in the beginning and then left that glory to become like a man or to become a man, always being holy God, but become a man on this earth. On the earth that he created, he walked among us. Emmanuel, God with us, Scripture tells us. He came to accomplish many things. We could not do anything on our own, including save ourselves, unless it was a holy God that came into our lives and called us to his glory. You can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do. You cannot be good enough. We do our works, if you will, our good works, because we were created for his good works, Ephesians 2 and 10. We were created for his good works so that we can accomplish what God and what Jesus had started on this earth. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. My work is finished. But our work just began. And Jesus took... 11 guys, we're going to talk about this. This is our scripture. Jesus took 11 guys and taught them, not everybody else, these 11 guys, to carry his message on. And it has grown to what Christianity is today. From 11 guys. We're going to see this in scripture. No one can provide salvation Except Christ, except Jesus. That salvation allows us into the presence, into the presence of a holy God. That salvation. So Jesus tells us over in John 3, you must be born again. He doesn't say it would be a good idea, though it would be. He says, you must be born again. So you have to be born again. Oh, well, that means I got to get dunked in the water, right? Well, I got dunked in the water 15 times so far, and it still didn't work. The water does nothing. 
The water does absolutely nothing. You must be dunked in the spirit in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit. Okay? That's where the baptism is. You must have a conversion in your heart, in your soul. You must be that new creation scripture talks about. The water is just water. It's just showing everybody else what you've already done in the spirit. Jesus says you must be born again of water, which is the word. In that scripture, John 3, which he's talking about, he's saying be born of the word or the water and the spirit, which the water is the word of God. That's why we teach the scriptures because it is the word of God. John 1, 1, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. The word is Jesus. Someday, someday, I shared with this with you last week. Someday, 1 John 3 and 2, it's where you'll find it. We shall see Jesus. We shall see the man Jesus. Just as I'm looking at Bubba, and I used that, I used you last week, Bubba, didn't I? Can I use you again this week? Well, good, because I'm going to. We will see Jesus face to face. Face to face. You, you will, I won't say you'll stand nose to nose, but because you might be a tall guy, you might be a short person, okay? Or vice versa, I don't know. But you will see Jesus face to face. What a glorious day that shall be. And it will be, it will happen. Why? This, because scripture tells us it will happen. And scripture is true. Scripture is true. In verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays to the Father to glorify him, Jesus, the man Jesus, to the glory he once had before anything else was. Verse 5, you can see that in John 17, verse 5. He says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So right there, Scripture tells us that Jesus existed before anything else was. Jesus, it tells us over in John 1 and 3, it says that I, or by him, nothing was made that was not made by him. So Jesus made everything that there is. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was born in a stable and put in a manger. Well, you got to know Scripture. Okay, Jesus existed before anything else was along with God, the Father, along with the Holy Spirit. Our triune God, which we worship. We might not totally understand it, but sometimes you accept stuff whether you understand it or not. Is anybody an electrician in here? Okay, nobody's an electrician? Okay, well, I'm fixing to use that very thing. All right, uh, Raul, do me a favor. Run out there real quick to the light switch. Okay, on the on the pa- on the wall out there, and just turn them off. No, 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 no. This is fine. Just turn them off. All right. Now, how that happen? Other than him flipping the switch. All right, turn them on, Bubba. How'd that happen? Do you understand it? Do you know exactly how all that works? Most people do not. Did it work? Sure it did. Well, it's the same thing with the triune God. We don't understand it all, but guess what? It works. It works. And so, if it's available for you to use, why are you going to walk around in darkness? Why not flip the switch and walk around in the light? That's what Scripture says. And we know God did just that by ascending Jesus back into heaven. You can write these scriptures down, but we're not going to go there yet. Acts 1, verse 10, Jesus ascended into heaven and seated him on his throne, on his throne at the right hand of the Father, Romans 8 and 34. Jesus is not here. Jesus is seated. Jesus the man is, Jesus the man is seated at the right hand of the Father on his throne. The Holy Spirit, which is also God, is here to be with each and every one of us. And that's very important. And we must understand, we do not have the Holy Spirit 
unless you have received your salvation through Jesus Christ. I hope you got that. Because if you missed that, you missed a very, very, very important part of your walk. A very vital part of your walk. God glorified him once again in the presence of himself, a holy God. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, and you can find this in Mark 3 and 35, we are brothers and sisters with Jesus. Brothers and sisters with Jesus. Mark 3 and 35. The promise is that belongs to Jesus is also ours. That we are get the same benefits as being a child of the Most High God just as Jesus is a child of the Father. We get the same benefits. Remember I've told you before there, there is a difference between being a uh, now I can't think of the word. <laughs> huh? Co-heir and yes. Heir, uh, joint heir and co-heir. Joint heir and co-heir. A co-heir means that, and I'm going to explain this real, real quick, means that Chris and John and I, John, Chris, and I, we get part of the promises of Jesus, part of the promises of God. He gets a share, he gets a share, and I get a share. A third, third, and a third, right? That's a co-heir. A joint heir means that uh, I get the, every bit of it. Uh, I'm pointing the wrong person. John gets every bit of it, and Chris gets every bit of it. I get everything, everything that is promised to Jesus is promised to me. Everything that is promised to Jesus is promised to Chris. Everything that is promised to Jesus is promised to, to John. Everything that is promised to anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ is promised to you. Those promises are, are yours. And we're going to see in just a second where his disciples, where Jesus' disciples are now seated, seated on thrones in heaven. We're going to see where Jesus says, you're going to sit on a throne in heaven. Because remember, we're talking about here in our scripture today, we're talking about his disciples, which we're fixing to start. Oh, we hadn't started yet? No. We ain't got started yet. You live. In verse 6 through 19, Jesus prays for his 11 disciples, apostles. His 11 disciples slash apostles. Not any future disciples or apostles. In this, in our scripture today, he prays for his disciples. His disciples are also appointed by Christ, called by Christ, face to face, individually. There's three things it tells us over in Acts 1. There's three, three, three things that make an apostle. I know a lot of people say that, oh, yes, well, I'm an apostle of Jesus, and this, I'm an apostle of God, et cetera, et cetera. According to scriptures, there's only three things. And one of those things is you have to be a witness to the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I don't think any of us lived 2,000 years ago. All right? So I'm not trying to talk against anybody who thinks they're an apostle or whatever. I'm simply saying there's three things <clears throat> that classify an apostle according to the scriptures. And if you don't meet all three of those criteria, then you do, you are not an apostle according to what I understand in the scriptures. Jesus is praying for his 11 buddies, let's say. And the reason that he's praying for in this section, the reason he is praying for those 11 buddies is because those are the start of his church. We read over in the book of Acts that Peter, Peter, the guy who says, oh, I'll never, ever desert you, yet denied him three times. We know the story. He actually started, if you will, or said the, the first awesome sermon of the new church when he stood up and he realized Jesus had called him to a calling to teach the word of God 
to teach. He was a disciple. He, he, he was a, a learner of the disciplines of Christ. And it was the apostles' job to carry that on. Now, the apostles had some other jobs too. And we're going to talk about that. And in my opinion, I'm going to say, and as far as I have seen, the apostles had specific gifts that they were given for a specific period of time. We're going to see that in just a little bit. And I'm going to share with you how those same signs and wonders can still happen today, but not because we are disciples. And in my opinion, we are not apostles. We weren't there 2,000 years ago. Jesus may have called you because everybody who is called is called by God. But we did, not rec we did not witness firsthand his death, burial, and resurrection. But you still can be a disciple. Do you have the powers that many people think that they have? We'll discuss it in a little bit. Or are we supposed to start yet? Oh, it's time to start now, right? All right. We will see over in, uh, let's go over, hold your place, keep your place, always keep your place on our scripture for today. So put a marker there. Let's go over to Mark 16. Mark 16. Now I know and many can say that these uh, particular scriptures that we're going to share here are not in the original writings and that is true. However, God led the people who put the canon together, who put the, church, who put the scriptures together to include these. And so I want to share them with you because this is what makes the difference between an apostle and a disciple. These are some of the things. Mark 16, starting at verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Wow, can you imagine to be re personally rebuked by Jesus? Man, that all scared the bejesus out of you. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Jesus walked the earth for 40 days, and he showed himself to many believers. Verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes in the baptism will be saved. Well, that's good news right there. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Uh, that's informative, is it not? That tells us right there that you must be baptized. Not baptized in water, baptized in the spirit. And the signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents and they will drink anything deadly. Don't test this, okay? Don't go out there and say, well, I'm going to drink some Clorox and see if it works. You're going to die. All right, this is not what it's saying. Remember last week we talked about drinking Jesus' blood and eating his flesh? All right, this is a spiritual teaching, all right? He is telling you something physical to teach you something spiritual. You don't go out and drink poison and say, oh, well, I'm a disciple, so I'm going to live. You'll die. Pretty simple. God gave you a good brain. <clears throat> they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. I just shared that a while ago, did I not? That's where he's at. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working in them, with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Signs, miracles, and wonders. Amen, it says. He gave the apostles, the eleven, powers for signs and wonders and miracles. He did not give that to you and me. We're, I'm going to share that with you in a little bit. Now, we can, we can go deeper with it. That, you have that available to you, but there's a certain way that it has to be done. He did not give you the signs, wonders, and miracles power that he gave the apostles. If Sorry, honey, I don't, mean, I don't remember your name. Give me your name right here in front. Marcy? Marcia. Okay, thank you. All right, Marcia's freezing right now. 
okay? If I were, if I were one of the apostles, I would just simply come up to her, I'm going to touch you, and say, heat up. And she'd heat up. She won't burn, okay? She's just going to heat up, all right? It's, he, it, he was able to give that power to his apostles. It, some, of the, some people said, if, if Peter's shadow would just touch us, we will be healed. If we could just have his shadow touch us. Remember what the, uh, the lady who had bled for 12 years, she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she was. That's the power I'm talking about. Now, can I go up there and touch her and warm her up? No. I might put the fear of God in her and warm her up. But I won't, okay? I don't do that. My point is, is that only, and I'm going to share this with you now. I was going to share it a little bit later. God works through us, okay? It's nothing we do except be obedient and let him work through us. We have seen people healed in this church. I'm going to give you this example real quick. Pappy, Pappy some of you know him, some of you don't. He was back there one day. He said, I got to have my shoulders worked on. Got to have surgery done on it. I don't know why God don't heal me, but he healed him, all right? Anyway, uh, I said, well, let's pray for you right now. And so we prayed for him. He went to the doctor two or three days later, whatever it was, and the doctor said, do this, and he did this. And the doctor says, you can't do that. And he said, well, I did it. And he says, well, if you can do that, you don't need an operation. He goes, well, there you go. We have seen healing happen in this church. It's not what we do. It's what God can do through those who believe. So you see, we, only pray, we pray for people up here out of obedience, Okay. Because we believe God heals. Not us. We're not, we're not healers. We're not soothsayers. We're not miracle workers. It's just God using this body. You know, God cannot use anything except your body to do his works. He can't use anything else. He uses you and me to do his works. Imagine that. Well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Submit to him and let him use you. That's what he wants you to do. And he can use you in mighty, mighty ways. Now, I know, I know there's people who have said, I've seen healings, I've seen healings. Understand, it ain't the person that's doing it. It is God doing it. Only Jesus heals. Only God heals. We don't do it. We are just his vessel. Just his vessel. Just his vessel. I want to be a vessel of God. I want to be a vessel of God. So don't go around here saying, oh, well, you can drink poison and hold up snakes and all this stuff. You'll die. Don't do that. That's not of God. This is the power he gave his disciples. I have totally lost where I was. Of the power and authority given to Christ's apostles, the 11, not, not throughout history. You can see it in Matthew 10, 1, which uh, I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, actually, we need to go to Matthew. I didn't show you that, did I? So let's do that. Let's go to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. And we're going to be here for just, just a bit. Matthew 10, verse 1. Now, I'm trying to reiterate the fact here that there's a lot of people out there who will try to make you believe, oh yes, you come unto me and I will heal you. I can tell you we have had people in this church, I'm not gonna mention any names, and people have come to him because they were convinced that that person would cause the healing. They did not get healed and their heart is truly broken they feel as though God must not love them. They feel as though God is denying them healing. Understand, we don't understand everything that God does and why and how he does it. But we must realize it is God and not us. It is no man that is walking this earth or has walked this earth other than Jesus Christ that does the healing. We have to realize that. Don't fall for these people who sit there and say, yes, if you would just send me $1,000, you will be healed. 
No, you'll be broke. Don't fall for that stuff, all right? Those are false teachers, false prophets that will pay dearly when they, face, when they stand face to face with Christ. Matthew 10 and 1, it says, And when he called his, tw his 12 disciples then, there was Judas with them at that time, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. He gave them the power. He passed that power on to them, not to us now, but to them. Go to verse uh, uh, 2 through 4. And now the names of the 12 apostles are first. See, he even names it. All right, so you can't put your name in there. Now, if your name is Simon or James or something like that, don't think he's talking about you, okay? Because you weren't there then, all right? So we, he even names the 12 that he gave the powers to. It says, the name of the 12 apostles are first Simon, who is Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, and the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Labias, or however you say that, uh, whose surname is Thaddeus. I can say Thaddeus better than the other one. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, and Judas Iscariot who would betray him. So he gave Judas Iscariot, even though he knew Jesus was going to betray him, he gave him that same power as a disciple. Look at verse uh, 8. Verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now see, he, this is to the 12 apostles now. Not everybody today, not anybody today. We don't do that. Peter and Silas, I believe it was, were walking down the road. It may have been Barnabas. They were walking down the road one day, and there's beggars on the side of the street. And he says, uh, give me what you have. Give me what you have. And Peter says, money and gold, I have none. But what I have, what I do give you will save your life. And that is the gospel of Christ. Okay? Jesus is the Savior. No one else is. Jesus is the healer. No one else is. Okay? It's that simple. Don't fall for false prophets and false teachers. Learn the word of God. Let's go to 2 Corinthians real quick. Way back over there. I have it marked, so I cheated. I knew ahead of time. 2 Corinthians, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. I just, just note to the side. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I, have, I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was, was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of the apostles are accomplished among you, with all per perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs of the apostles. The signs of the apostles. Not false teachers and false prophets. The signs of the apostles. He gave them that power. I don't have that power. All I have is faith. All I have is obedience. All I have is trust. That God will do what he says he's going to do. For God is not a liar. About anything. God is not a liar. So this section. Yeah, we're fixing to start. So this section is about the apostles and not the rest of the world. This section over in John 17. John 17. Is about the apostles of Christ. The eleven. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept my word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me. And they have received them, received them. That means believed them, uh, taken them in as truth. And they have received them, and they, know, they have known surely that I have, came forth from you, 
and they have believed that you sent me. They have believed that you sent me. The power of Jesus' name was given to the 11 and later to Paul and all things given to Christ were given to them. Now, when you read through these scriptures and you see these signs, wonders, and miracles, these things happened. Paul, a kid, third floor. There's Paul is praying. You think you have a long preacher here that tr teaches all day long or goes for a long, long time? Paul preached into the night. How many of you want to stay here to the night? I'm good. Amen. There was a kid up in the third window. Paul preached so long the guy fell asleep and fell out of the window and hit the ground and died. He hit the ground and died. I'm not going to kill you. I hope to keep you awake, but I'm not going to kill you. But Paul went down and laid on the kid, and he, wrote, he came back alive. Those are the powers and wonders and signs and miracles that the apostles have. Touch people, and they lived. Touch people, and they were healed. We don't have that power. God has that power, but he can use you and me to touch other lives and raise them from the dead. Oh, no, I could never go out here and raise anybody from the dead. Yes, you can. You can. Well, how do I do that? I'll give it to you real simply. Do you realize that if, you're, if you have a friend who is not saved, they are dead according to scriptures? They are dead. They're going to hell and going to burn, if you will. I don't mean to teach hell, fire, and damnation, but it's a real thing. It's a real thing. They're going to go to hell. Eternal lake of fire. Pain and sorrow. Gnashing of teeth. Weeping. Forever and ever and ever and ever. But you have the power to raise them from the dead. Oh, yeah. Tell me how to get that power. I want to go out and touch somebody. I want to see them go, whoo! I'm alive. Well, that's exactly what we do. By teaching the word of God. You see, if, thank you, Marcia. Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. I bet you've heard that a million times. <laughs> For you kids, uh, I, well, y'all might remember it. Uh, the Partridge family, was it Partridge family? Brady Bunch, Brady Bunch. There was a girl in there named Marcia, and there was her middle sister who always said, now, Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. <laughs> That's where that comes from. I know it's old, but we're old, so there you go. All right? Anyway. Where was I at? Uh, if I came to Marcia here and, and Marcia was dead in her sins, she had not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I come to her and I say, Marcia, let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Let me tell you what he's done for me. He raised me from the dead. Well, what do you mean? You died? No, I was dead. What? Yeah, I was dead. <sighs> let me stand up. That went over my head. I was dead in my sins. That means I did not have Christ. I did not have eternal life with Jesus. I did not have eternity in a beautiful, beautiful heaven that God intended this earth to have in the very beginning. And I was going to hell. Not only was I going to hell, but I was later going to go to the eternal lake of fire and suffer for eternity. I was dead. But Christ touched my heart, Martha. He touched my very soul, touched my spirit. And he raised me from the dead. And Christ, not me, Christ will do the exact same thing for you. He'll do the exact same thing for you. Why? Because he loves you. Oh, but you don't know, Marcia says, you don't know what all the, I've done. It don't matter. There's only one un unforgivable sin. There's only one unforgivable sin, and that is to deny the Holy Spirit. That is to not receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you would, I don't care if you've murdered, I don't care if your mouth say tongue, uh, that stupid idiot over in Russia right now, uh, uh, whatever his name is, Putin, yeah, that, that's kind of an appropriate name, wouldn't you think? Okay, I don't, I don't care if you're him, I don't care if you're Adolf Hitler, I don't care who you are, all right? They can be saved. What? They can. They can be saved. But he's murdered millions of innocent people. You're not God. You're not God. God says, all those who call unto me shall be saved. We refer that back to the third man on the cross. Boy, I don't know if we're going to finish this chapter or this section today. 
we go back to the third man on the cross. The third man on the cross is what we, we call it, or refer to it as. It's the one who was dying next to Jesus. There were two men, one on each side. One of them was shouting blasphemies to Jesus. The other one says, do you not realize who this guy is? Do you not see who this guy is? And he, he turned to Jesus. Why, he was going to die. He's going to die in just a few, few moments, a few minutes. He turned to Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you get into your father's house. Remember me when you go home to be with our father. When you go home to be with God. Remember me. Just, he just wanted Jesus to remember his name. Jesus turned to him and says, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. The guy never did anything good in his life. I mean, evidently he was suffering uh, from a, uh, 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 he was suffering the, the worst death that any man could think, but he had actually done a, uh, a whatever a high crime is, heinous crime. a heinous crime, that's not the word I'm looking for, but uh, one that deserved death, whatever crime he did. It says the thieves, uh, you don't die for stealing, they just chop your hands off. They should still do that from time to time, I think. But he evidently had been part of uh, uh, Bartimaeus' uh, uh, regime, if you will, and caused a lot of riots, caused a lot of heartaches, insurrections, et cetera, et cetera, probably murdered people, et cetera, because he had received a death sentence. So he had done something really, really bad. Really bad. He deserved to die. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So you think you've done stuff bad? You don't hold a candle to that dude. You don't hold a candle to him. So why are you going to let yourself hear this? Why are you going to allow yourself to suffer eternity? Why not just call on the name of Jesus and be saved? Pfft. How difficult is that? I'm going to give you that opportunity at the end of our teaching, which might be 3 o'clock. We say uh, that God predestines people. God predestined these 11. Now, predestination is a whole different teaching, and we're not going to go into that today. But I want you to understand the predestination is God knowing what you're going to do. God knowing what you're going to do. God foreknew that after I went through all the junk that I went through in my life that really educated me, that I was going to finally say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. And it took a long time and some hard knocks for a hard head and a strong back. But he breaks you down. Why? Because when you are weak, he's the strongest. And he can take care of anything you got. It doesn't matter what it is. And he can use you if you will allow him to. And if God wants you, he knows who's going to answer his call. And he knows when you're going to answer his call. And he is ready for you standing there at the door knocking, waiting for you to open the door. So why not open the door? Your life will change, I guarantee you. Just accept the fact that God knows who his children will be. For God knew these 11 would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Holy One of God. And they realized it, even though, remember where it said over in the scripture that he rebuked their hard-heartedness? Well, he can rebuke your hard-heartedness too and reveal himself to you to where you will finally understand Jesus saves. Jesus saves. We don't save. I don't save. You don't save. Jesus saves. Verses 9 through 10. John, of course, John 17, 9 through 10, 2 through 10. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. 
wait a minute, Jesus, why wouldn't you pray for the world? Because he came into the world that was not his own. John 1, he came into the world that was not his own, and he also came into the world that would not accept him, though his own would not accept him. He says, I pray for them, the disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. For they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Everyone that comes to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you now belong to God. You can wear the badge, child of the Most High God. If you do not have Jesus, you cannot wear that badge. Wouldn't you like to show your shiny badge to everybody? Hey, look at my badge. I'm a child of the Most High God. And I am proud of it. I am very proud of it. I humbled myself to realize I needed a Savior. And that Jesus, and that Jesus my Savior, never would turn his back on me. He wouldn't turn me loose. He kept after me for years and years, years and years and years. What a knothead I am. But he kept after me and kept after me. Why? Because he knew once he got this overly anxious person. I won't say I'm hard-headed. I just believe in Jesus Christ and there ain't nothing you can do to change my mind. And I know Jesus saved me. But I also know he'll save you. And he never let me go. Never. It's amazing. I would have, I'd have given up on me a long time ago, but he didn't. Jesus accepts them. And his father accepts them. He accepts them on behalf of his father because his father has basically chosen them. He chose those 11. Just like he calls you. Jesus, the scripture tells us no one comes to the Father unless they are called. No one comes to the Father unless they're called. You would not even be sitting here in this uh, sanctuary today unless God has, called, has not called you. You're here because God has called you. No, I'm here because my wife said I had to come to church today. And besides, they're putting on a good feed today. That's the reason I'm here. No, it isn't. You just think it is. Why? Because God can use anything he wants to to get, a, get your attention. And he will. I won't say he can use a nagging wife, but, but that's certainly possible. I want to stay in your grace, okay? In John 10 and 30, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to. It's a couple of pages back, if you will. John 10 and 30. And I love this scripture. John 10 and 30, it says, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. So many people you will run into, especially people who have been in church two or three times, or maybe even some churches, if you want to call them churches, they'll say, oh, no, God, Jesus is not God. Jesus is the Son of God. Had a guy one time call me up and says, do your church believe that Jesus is the Son of God or G Jesus is God? I said, Jesus is actually both. What do you mean? Well, according to Jesus, and I believe Jesus, Jesus says in a couple, only a couple of places, he calls himself Son of Man most of the time to, to reveal to us his manhood, to reveal to us as though, uh, to, so that we can look upon him as a man, which is very hard to, for us to do because we believe he is God. But he says that he is the son of man. On a few times, on a few occasions, I think it's two or three, it's, only, it's all there is, he refers to himself as the son of God. As the son of God. Right here he says, I and the father are one. So when this guy called me and says, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God or do you believe that Jesus is God? I said, I believe both. Why? Because scripture tells me he is both. He is both God and he is the son of God, as well as the son of man, as well as Yeshua, as well as the Messiah, as well as the Savior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't put a tag on Jesus. Jesus is God. We believe in a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are three deities, if you will. Three. There are three deities, if you will. 
But there are three individual people or powers or deities or however you want to call it, but they're all one God. That's just the way it is. Accept it. Well, I don't understand it. You don't understand electricity. And you use it every day. But you accept it. That way you don't walk in darkness. There's a scripture there. All right? Just to let you know. John 3 and 19 through 23, I think it is, 24. What belongs to the Father belongs to the Son, and what belongs to the Son belongs to the Father. You are God's if you are Jesus's. If you are Jesus's, you are God's. Belonging to God. You're not a God, okay? Oh, pastor said I'm a God. That's not what I said. It's not what I said, all right? Although scripture does refer to us as little g gods of this earth. Little g gods of this earth. That means rulers of the earth, okay? Verse 11. 17, 11. Now I am no longer in the world. Je this is Jesus speaking. He is no longer in the world. What? Wait a minute. Has he ascended yet? Bear with me a second. Now I'm no longer in the world, but this, these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them was lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture pardon me, might be revealed, that the scripture might be revealed. We're going to talk about the son of perdition in just a second. Even though Jesus had not yet ascended into heaven, we see that over in Acts 1, he had not yet descended into heaven, he is, of, he of, course, of course, knew what the future holds. If God knew that Judas was going to betray Jesus, if God knew that the other disciples were going to come to Jesus and receive him as the Messiah, if God knew that you were going to be saved, if God knows all these things, then he knows all things. So Jesus knew that he was going to ascend into heaven because he is God. Don't think that this, uh, this surprised Jesus at all. Him and God in the very, very beginning before anything else was, I can see him sitting around the campfire, if you will, even though there was no earth or fire or anything else at that time. But I can see him sitting around the campfire and God saying, guess what, son? You're going to die for people who don't even like you. What? Yeah, you're going to die for people who don't even like you. Matter of fact, they're going to show you as you are being led to your death. They're going to show you how much they hate you. What? Yes, it's going to be the most horrible death that you could possibly imagine. It's going to come upon you. And it's going to hurt like, excuse my French, like hell. Hell's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Not only is it going to hurt your body, it's going to hurt your soul, and it's going to hurt your spirit. And then guess what else? I, your father, am going to turn my back on you for three hours. Oh, <laughs> is that what Jesus said? That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I will be obedient to death on the cross. I will be obedient to death on the cross. I will suffer all of this. Get this now. I will suffer all of this so that Bubba can spend eternity with me. You're pretty important there, Bubba. Yeah. I will suffer all of this so Kathy can spend eternity with me. I will suffer all of this so that Deanne will spend eternity with me. Jesus voluntarily, he says, I choose to lay down my life and I choose to take it up again. He chose to do it. But when God laid it on him and said, and I'm going to turn my back on you for three hours because you are going to become the sin of the world, not just pay for the sins. You are going to be sin. I wouldn't step up and do it. But Jesus said, yes, Father, obedient until death on the cross. And how much did that aggrieve Jesus to be separated from God for three hours? 
tells us over in the Gospel of Luke. He says, Jesus in the garden, he told his disciples, he says, my soul, my soul is in agony to the point of death to where his sweat were like drops of blood. His soul was in, his spirit was in agony because he knew he had to face separation from the Father for three hours. Three hours. Not eternity. Three hours. And so his message to you is, is if, it, if it agonizes my soul to the point of death, guess what eternity is going to be for you? But Jesus knew what was going to happen in the end. He was going to be glorified. And this is going to lead us up to the end, which we're not going to finish. It is so vitally important that we understand what Jesus has done for us. He has paid the price that we cannot pay. We cannot pay it. Oh, well, you don't know me, man. I got a bank account that's just got zero after zero after zero. I can pay for anything. You cannot. All the money in the world belongs to God anyway. All the money in the world could not pay for your salvation. All the works that you do, all the good deeds that you do, cannot pay for your salvation. There is one thing and one thing alone that can pay for your salvation, and it has already been paid by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. He is the only one that was qualified to pay for your sin debt and mine. He was sinless. Now let's talk about the one appointed for perdition. Perdition means utterly destroyed or damned or sent to hell, if you will. It literally means hell. Perdition literally means hell. The one who was appointed or who was selected, if you will, he wasn't selected by God saying, Okay, poor old Judas, you know, he's a good old boy, but he's going to be our scapegoat. That's in Scripture, by the way. If you don't know, it's in the Old Testament, a scapegoat. That's where it comes from, Scripture. Most everything we even talk about or know comes from Scripture. It really does. If you search the Scriptures, you'll find the answer to every question you can have. Every question. Judas knew because of his self-centeredness, his selfishness, in his self-pride, he knew that he was going to betray Jesus. When the Pharisees came to him and says, hey, actually, if you read that scripture, you'll see the Pharisees didn't come to him. He went to the Pharisees. And they said, hey, if you want to know this dude, if you want to capture this dude, if you want to arrest him, guess what? I can help you do that because I know him. I've walked with him for three and a half years. I can put, I can put you on him. Anybody hunt here? Anybody, hunters, bird hunters mainly? You put your, your dog whenever he goes out there and he points, right? He knows where that bird is, right? Well, G, G, uh, Judas is like a bird dog. He goes, come on, I'll point to him. Matter of fact, I'll do a little bit better in pointing. I'll go up to him and I'll kiss him. And the one that I kiss on the cheek, that is the one you want to arrest. What a betrayal. Jesus even said, friend, do you betray me with a friendly kiss, a holy kiss? And he did. Judas was evil in his heart, and he refused to repent. We have a lot of people that way today. They're evil in their heart. Putin is one of them. And they're evil in their heart. And unless they get a heart attack and change that heart, they are destined for hell because they're evil. But just like the third man on the cross who per most likely was an evil person, there is salvation in the name of Jesus. All you have to do is repent. All you have to do is repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. The son of perdition, God knew what Judas was going to do. He foreknew it. He knew it beforehand. He didn't say, okay, Judas, you're going to be the bad boy. Judas chose to be the bad boy. 
He chose to be the bad boy. And then he realized, of course, what he had done. And in such remorse, he went out and destroyed himself. Don't do that. Because just like Judas, he could have been saved if he had... Can you imagine what would have happened if, if it had been turned around? Now, God lays it out. He knew the plan, and the plan will be followed, just like your life. The plan for your life will be followed. Oh, no, no, no. I'm my own boss. <laughs> yeah, you think you are. You think you are. God has called you already, or you would not be in this, you would not be sitting in that chair that you're in if God had not called you. The problem is, is your hard heartedness, your self pride, your unwillingness to surrender. And most of us guys all go through that. But guess what? At some point in time, God shall win. He will win. He will win. So why are you going to fight God? You remember when Jacob fought God, wrestled with him all night long, and God just went and touched his hip, and so there he walked with a limp the rest of his life. You want to be limping around? Certainly not. God has not chosen you to betray Jesus. That story's done. God has chosen you to surrender to Christ to build his kingdom. Because on the cross, Jesus says it is finished. It is finished. His work. And he sat at the right hand of the Father. Now, as he sent these 11 out, and we're going to finish this next week. As he sent his 11 out to do his bidding for their lives, he is also sending you and calling you out to do the exact same thing. Oh, you mean I, need, I get to be a disciple? Who? I get to wear the badge? Boy, that'd be so cool. I can walk around saying, hey, I'm a disciple. Well, are you? What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who walks in the disciplines of Christ. That means you follow Christ's example. Not your example, not someone else's example. You follow Christ's example. Well, how am I going to know his example? Come on. It ain't that hard, is it? You got it in your lap. You got it in your lap. This is Jesus. It is the word. It's the written word. But in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And in John 1 and 14, it says, And the word became flesh. and made his dwelling among us. You have Jesus in your lap. At least I hope you do. If you don't, I'll give you one. If you don't have a Bible, hey, these are mainly for kids, but... Hey, you don't have one? Boy and girl, take your pick. I'll give you one. That's really not for adults, but I'll see that you get a Bible. I'll go buy you one if you don't have one. You must learn the Word. You're not going to learn it on your own. You're not going to learn it from me. Jesus himself said, you will not learn it from man. You will learn it from the Holy Spirit. How do you learn it from the Holy Spirit? By opening God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, and letting the Holy Spirit reveal to you what God wants you to know from that Scripture at that particular time. That's how you learn. We do Bible study after Bible study after Bible study after Bible study after Bible study here. That's all we do is Bible study. Why? Because you need to know the Word. Oh, I don't want to know the Word. I just want to know Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. And I pray, I pray, I pray. And we do. We pray for you all the time. And I thank you for your, your prayers too. Oh, my knee's killing me and I could use some prayer for it. I got a knot right there that just uh, hurts. Pops every time I take a step. My point is simply this. God loves you. Wait a minute. What do you mean God loves me? I don't even know God. It don't matter whether you know him. He knows you. He created you in your mother's womb for his good purpose before you were even thought of by your mom and dad. You are here for his good pleasure, not yours. 
So why not serve the one who gives every blessing that there is? You want to be blessed? Be a blessing. How do we be a blessing to God? We serve him. How do we serve him? We serve him by serving others. That's how we do it. That's how it's done. I'm not asking you to come up here and preach or teach or anything except for him. And maybe a couple others. What I'm asking you to do is search out Jesus yourself. Seek God. See, that's what it says over in James. In the book of James, it says, um, draw nearer to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, how do I draw near to God? You search out his word. That's how you do it. And if you're not studying God's word, come to here on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're here a lot. Come here and we'll help you search his word. Because that's what we do. Why? Because we love you. What? You don't even know me. I don't have to know you. God knows you. And God loves you. And since God loves you, this church loves you. Church, the congregation, I don't mean the building. I don't know if this building can love me or not. But this congregation can. This congregation can. And this congregation does. Why? Because Jesus does. So our goal, our goal here is to help you know who Jesus is. To help you know who God is. To help you feel and have the power of the Holy Spirit. To help you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, which leads to repentance and salvation for your soul. That's our goal. I ain't anybody important. Chris, not anybody important. His wife's pretty important. My wife's pretty important. We have to say that to stay on the good side. But you are important. You are very, very important. Oh, I'm not that important. I'm not that big a deal. Friend, you better get this right. John 3.16 you heard it a while ago, you'll hear it again, you'll hear it over and over and over. In your Bible, uh, most of you have closed it, and that's okay, but just remember this. In your Bible, don't, and if you don't want to write in your Bible, fine, slip a piece of paper in there. And write on there, in John 3.16, where it says, whosoever, put your name right there. Put your name right there. If Marcia shall believe in Jesus Christ... She shall receive eternal life. Be a whosoever. Because if you're not, your destination, and this is in Scripture, friend, your destination is eternal hell, fire, and damnation. Oh, well, I don't believe in that stuff. It don't matter. Do you know how electricity works? It works. Do you know how the Word of God works? No. It works whether you believe it or not. So just receive Jesus today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father God, if there's anyone today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, I urge you to touch their hearts, minds, souls, and spirits. You got them here. You brought them here. So now it's time for them to realize their destiny, their purpose, your will for their lives, which is to carry on the message of Jesus Christ to all the world, not to people in this church. We're good to go. Carry it from this church out into the world. Father, I ask you to touch that life, that soul, that spirit who has not received you as Lord. And I ask you who have not received Jesus before as Lord and Savior, search your heart, soften your heart, and I don't want to say whether you believe it or not, but whether you really understand it or not, just believe and call on the name of Jesus. I'm going to lead you what, through what we call the sinner's prayer. And it's that simple. And that's all you have to do. Because once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit will come and dwell inside you, and he will change your life from this point on. You will be that new creation. 
You have to still and continue surrendering to the word of the Lord and to God's will for your life, and he will take you places that you could never have imagined. And he can bring such joy into your life that it surpasses your understanding. Philippians 4. Just say, Dear Jesus, but mean it in your heart. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you will forgive me. I ask for your forgiveness for all of my sins. I ask you to take me from this point on, guide and direct my life for your glory. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Glory be to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.